Welcome to the Leaders Mindset, where we bring you illuminating conversations with leaders who are making an impact in business and our communities. Thanks so much to everyone who's been watching the, the past few months and listening on the audio only platforms. And thank you for checking out all of our amazing guests. And as far as guests goes, we have double the fun for you today, because today we have Miles Weibel and Macy Ardwin. They're the founders of the Bully Brew House here in Las Vegas. It's a coffee themed American bully kennel. I'm gonna let them explain what that is to you. I'm not gonna to try to do it, but I'm gonna let them all talk about what that means. But the reason I wanted to have you both on today is not so much to talk about your business, but I do wanna get into that. But, and your business is amazing, but you are also leading the community through a change in people's views and attitudes about American bullies. And that's really what I wanna to get to in our talk today. So first, thank you for being with us. And before we get into all the amazing things that you're both doing to make the world a better place, your website says that this is all based on a true love story. And we don't get to talk about love stories on this podcast very much. So tell us about you both and tell us your love story before we get into all the nuts and bolts of the business side of things. Okay. All right. <laughs> you Enjoy it. So Miles and I met, well, we met maybe like seven years ago, but yes. we've been together for five years. We started as friends. I met him at a bar. <laughs> it's the typical bar story. He was the bartender. I thought he was super cute. Uh, we just kind of stayed friends for a little bit. There was actually a point in time where... I was young, in and out of a previous relationship, so I thought Miles was so cute. My guilty conscience had to block him so that I wouldn't be tempted to text him. And then at some point, I think I unblocked you. Yeah. We never had a falling out or anything like that. We just like really vibed and got along. And I was like, oh, this is a bad idea if I'm not going to be you know, single <laughs> to be friends with this guy. And then one of our first conversations was the best conversation that we had we talked about his dog which was the screensaver on his phone and from that point we both knew we were dog people i right. would say yeah we both it was automatically known that we would both shared a passion for the dog because i mean my screensaver came up she noticed it and then we just immediately the conversation just started rolling and there was never any gaps in it and we just both started talking about how much we love dogs and I mean, I've always been a dog person, so that was a big deal to me that she's also a dog person. And then there we go. We fast forward now, five, seven, six years later, and here we are. You know what I mean? That's it's our passion, it's our love, and it's still based around the dogs. Yeah. Well, it's sound. Oh, go ahead, Macy. I was just going to say the the love story, aside from us romantically being together, it's the the passion and love that we have for our dogs that really connected us off jump and you can tell when there's true dog people when there's people that say that there's dog people and then everybody in between <laughs> that's all we talk about we live and breathe our dogs yeah. which is awesome that we have i always say i couldn't i couldn't imagine doing what we do with anyone else because it's a lifestyle and we both since we're both passionate about it it's something that we have to choose every single day yeah, I mean, I've got a dog myself, and you really do have to put them first, and it's got to be at the top of your priority list all day, every day to take care of those puppies. And Miles, like you said, you have a history going back with dogs to when you were to when you were a small child, right? Tell us about your history with dogs. Yeah, I mean, growing up, my mom always had a dog in the house. Like, it was something that we always had. We always had a pet. We always had an animal in the house, and... I mean, neither something would happen, the dog would run away or something would happen and she would always get another dog. So, I mean, I grew up with, with animals inside the house constantly and I've always bonded and been a dog person, I guess, because of that. And then as I got a little bit older, I, of course, dog people attract dog people, you know, and uh, a few of my friends also had dogs and we kind of started getting into the breeding a little bit and like just dabbling into it and playing around and I figured out how much I loved it. And then I kind of just, it, it ended up getting away from me because I mean, I focused on other things, college and stuff like that. But it's always been in the back of my mind of how much I loved it. And it's, it's I realized now doing it again, that it has been my passion for a long time and I've always loved it. And there's always been a place in my heart for dogs and breeding. 
Well, I love to see when people, they have a lot of things going on in their lives, but they find a way to get that passion and they get that front and center, both in terms of their personal life and their professional life. I love to see that. It sounds like you've really been successful doing it. So this was a little bit news to me when you, when the three of us first talked. So let's clear it up for the audience. Cause I'm not sure everybody knows what are American bullies and how did you get involved in raising them? Um, American Bullies, it's kind of a newer breed. It was officially established in 2004 by Dave Wilson, and the American Bully Kennel Club was created, which was the official founding registration of them. It takes 75 to 100 years to establish a breed, so that's why we say they were officially recognized in 2004. It's still very, very new. What it is is kind of the family-style version of the American Pitbull so you have the Staffordshire Terrier, American Pitbull, and then they took other bully breeds that were more family friendly, like bulldogs, because originally Pitbulls right. were game dogs, they were working dogs. So they wanted to curb that because, and we can both attest to this, Pitbulls have the most loyal, loving hearts. If they, if they have a little bit more energy, so they wanted to make something that was your modern day house hippo is what the American bullies are known as. Oh, so it was smaller. Also, they were smaller. Your average pit bull usually runs around 45 to 55 pounds. So it's more of a leaner dog. It has a lot of energy. Um, and what they kind of wanted to do was take that same dog with that same loyalness and the same demeanor and kind of calm it down a little bit, but add muscle mass to it. And that's how it, they started mixing the kind of the English bulldog with it. And it just derived as the American bully now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they bred it out to where it's its own breed now. There are certain breeds, the American Pitbull, Staffordshire Terrier, and English Bulldog that should be the only breeds in it. Of course, when you're creating something new, people put all kinds of things into it. So we're working to establish the true American Bully as a community and not go too crazy with it like, right. like our community has. Um, so we're trying to create a healthier, more stable version of the American Bully that is a very versatile dog. Uh, they sound awesome, and I can't, I can't wait to get the clip out where you talk about the modern-day house hippo. I think that's going to be fantastic. So uh, do – are American bullies caught up in the same perception that pit bulls are? What is the perception uh, – gi give me the rundown of the perception that's kind of out there, both about pit bulls and American bullies, and what it is you're trying to change, and then we'll get into how you're trying to change it. Absolutely. I mean, there's automatically the pit bull has a bad reputation as being a ferocious dog, a mean dog, attacks people. Um, and just it, it's it, people believe that this dog just wants to do that, that they're just born wanting to bite someone and wanting to attack people. And at the end of the day, the dog really doesn't. The dog just wants to please its owner. And it thinks that it's going to fight with that other dog. It's going to bite that person. It's going to protect you because it all wants to do that for you. And that's where it kind of gets misconstrued because the dog is not naturally a mean dog. Now, some of them are, but most of the time, they're just doing something to protect their owner and to protect you because they, they want to do right by you. And what happens is now is that the pit bull has a such bad reputation that now the bullies have a similar look to the pit bull. So it automatically gets characterized by that saying, oh my God, that's a pit bull. It's a mean dog. It's vicious. And they just get judged by the way they look. And the main mission that me and Macy are trying to do is prove that these dogs are just as loyal, just as good, and just as docile as your, as your Cocker Spaniel or your Labrador or anything else that can stay in the house and loves you. It just has that ability to protect you if you ever need it to. And what I think is interesting is we cannot say every single American bully is a star student. Not every single Labrador is a star student. Dogs are just like people. There are many different types of dogs, just like there are many different types of people. And there, I always say, because these dogs can be powerful because of their build, you know, their muscular definition and the, 
they just can be a powerful dog that we should always handle them with care. We should, we should learn about dogs. We should learn about this type of dog, the behavior, the environment, show signs. If my dog has anxiety, if I'm feeding my dog's ego, I've been told by our trainer, we were feeding one of our dog's ego by letting him have his own chair and he was king of the house. And that's why he didn't like the other guys in the house. So there's things that you have to educate yourself as an owner doesn't matter if you're a breeder or you show dogs. As an owner, as a responsible pet owner, you should be educating yourself about your dog, the breed, the world, and how you raise, train, and socialize your dog as well. Excellent. I love to hear that. and explains a lot about why my lab thinks she's such a princess. So, <laughs> She is. She is. So, so before we dig into the business, I understand what it is you – what it is you want the community to start understanding about bullies. What are some of the outreach efforts you're doing? How are you trying to change those opinions, change those hearts and minds about American bullies? We take our dogs out is the number one thing. And we do it for their training, but also for other people to see how they are. They usually flock a ton of attention, but occasionally I will get the lady who is scared to get out of her right. car I'll have to walk across the street, walk on the other side of the sidewalk. I will get the lady in Home Depot who is screaming at me over my six-month-old dog outside in the garden area. That has happened. So calmly, how we carry ourselves and how we deal with those situations, take it as a time to educate people. We don't know if that person had a traumatic experience as a child and now they're just terrified of all dogs. So I think coming with a confident and educational perspective whether it's in person which makes the biggest impact yeah. or on our social media which we use our platform to put out educational content the other stigma we have to fight is that we are breeders yes and there are some terrible breeders just like there are terrible teachers and terrible lawyers there's terrible people in every industry and we want to definitely set the tone and show people that there are good breeders so we're putting out educational content for their reputation, for our reputation, and to show others how they can be better as well. And another thing that we're truly focusing on is we're really, really trying to get our bullies into service dog training. We have a couple of dogs. One of them right now is he's a puppy and he's going to be leaving to go to his training soon. And he's going to be a diabetic alert dog. And that way, his because this guy, he has a son, and the, the app and the phone failed. And the mom didn't even know that his blood sugar was crashing. So it kind of scared the family. So he, she was like, started looking into it. And then we decided that we're going to send one of our dogs to training to have this. We also have another one of our dogs that's going to be an emotional support dog. Because we're striving to do this because you don't normally see this breed as a service dog. You don't see someone getting on a plane that's a diabetic alert dog with a bully. You don't see that. So we're trying to curve it, and we want to be the first to do it. That way we can also show people, not necessarily being the first, but it's just to show people that these dogs are able to do this kind of work and hold this kind of compassion. That's it. Well, it sounds like you're doing amazing things, not just to serve the breed, not just to create a business, but to also serve the community and show that American bullies can be great servants in the community as well as a dog breed. I think that's amazing. Thanks. So let's get into the business. We've never had a business quite like this in the podcast before. So tell me about the kennel side of things. Tell me what it is you're doing, what you believe makes a good breeder and how you're following through on that. And then tell me how the coffee fits into all of this. Cause I think that's a fascinating story as well. Okay. So off jump, you know, our dogs are the mascot for our brand. So all of our coffee items are represented by our dogs. One other reason that we did that is because we love dogs. We love coffee. It's something that we need every single day. So they are complete opposites, but they go together. But it also helps that I have a cute face on a cup of coffee. That will help anyone that's getting their first impression of my dogs automatically go, wow, that's so cute. I love coffee. And I'm coming with a positive approach to why you should like the dog, not, hey, this is the dog. This dog is the best on the planet. Like this dog. So we wanted to come with a friendly approach that made sense to the normal person, and most people do drink coffee. I think what makes a good breeder is the reason why you're breeding. Right. You can have all kinds of resources. 
And there's other things that can make you a good reader, of course. Your setup, your environment, how you do things, testing. Knowledge. But I think the main thing that makes you a good breeder is why you're breeding. That's right. We, one of the stigmas we fight, you breed for money, you sell dogs for money. If people had any clue how much money it cost, they would, if they would look at our books, they would not say that. So if you're going to do this, this is the one of the most expensive startups I've ever done. And you need something else, another reason we have the coffee, to keep it going. It is not something you can quit all and say, this is what I do, this is all I do, and it's a great life. No, it is hard work. It is up all the time. It is you have to sacrifice vacations, sure. free time, partying. It's truly a choice. So, but why do you do it? Because you genuinely love it. Just like an artist loves creating a masterpiece. These are the tools. This makes me proud. This is why I do it. And I think that makes a good breeder. Absolutely. I, I totally agree with her. And it's, I think it's your, your ultimate goal is why you're doing it. And I mean, our, our ultimate goal is to make the bullies better to produce a perfect bully. And it's not say perfect, but just to kind of produce the ones that we think should be produced. And it's, they got a lot of other people that do it for different reasons, and we just do it because of them. And the way the coffee kind of fell into it, like you said, I mean, you're having a dog, it's an everyday job. You can't have, you can't be like, oh, I'm tired today and I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna focus on my dog. You have to, you have to wake up, you have to walk it, you have to feed it, you have to do everything, hug it, cuddle it, talk to it. And I mean, on those days that I don't feel like doing it, the best way that really motivates me is a cup of coffee. So that'll get me up and really wanting to start my day. So that's how we orchestrated the two to come together. And it's like, man, these are two things that most people, a lot of the people in the world love is coffee and dogs. So let's put them together and let's see what happens. And here we are. Well, I love both coffee and dogs and I'm glad you guys are getting your coffee because you just had a litter and I'm sure that's taken up a lot of time and energy and keeping you awake. How is that going? How is the new litter doing? It's a, it's a rough one. It's a, uh, <laughs> it's a rough one. We've had a bunch of them before. Um, I think this is probably the hardest one we have ever had um, because of a runt that we have. And we, we call it the runt because he's technically the smallest one out of the litter. And he's literally the biggest one is five pounds and he's weighing 1.6 ounces right now. So he's I just a, saw his picture on your social media. I think it was yesterday. And he is, he's a cutie. Oh, he's super cute. And everybody loves him. And everybody loves a good story for the, for the, for the Rudy factor. You know what I mean? Maybe the old show Rudy just fighting for Notre Dame. So it's like, he's kind of like the Rudy, the, the small guy. And I mean, he's lively. He's fighting. And I think a lot of it, our, our vet commended me yesterday about me and Macy's knowledge and ability that we put into this and he's like you guys are doing a perfect job we couldn't even do it better than you guys so it's better that he's with y'all y'all doing an amazing job and just keep on going he said this is going to be our little problem child but he's going to make it through so that's pretty much it we're, we're we're just doing it a lot of coffee and a lot of patience <laughs> patience patience is the key there, there will be times where <laughs> we're both just tired and annoyed and he's you know the biggest reason he is so small is because he has so much trouble eating yeah. for the first three, two, three and a three. half, basically four weeks of his life. Anytime he was just on milk and not solid food, it's coming through his nose, which is called aspiration. What you are at risk for is pneumonia, which will kill them instantly. Right. So the whole time where you need to eat but you're having trouble eating, why can't you get it? And it's, it's frustrating because you want him to make it, you want him to be as strong as possible. But there was times where he really scared Miles. Miles like, I'm not giving him a bottle anymore. I don't wanna do it. So we had, to, basically, he was choking because he aspirated so much fluid. Luckily, I don't know how I got so good at resuscitation and CPR with these dogs, but we shook him back and He's good now, yeah. but it's totally scared Miles. He did not want to do the bottle anymore. So we just, we get to the point where you're trying so hard, you almost want to quit at times. You almost want to give up because you feel like all of your efforts, it just keeps happening over and over and you can't fix the problem, but you don't, you keep going. And he's had the best days that he's had the yeah. last three days. I mean, Benny's amazing. He's, 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 a, he's a true little story 
it's going to be great to see him turn out and, and live a long life. I like when Miles says, he's like, you know, bro, we're invested now. We're four <laughs> weeks in. We're invested. You have to, you have to you go have through. To, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm invested now, and I've only known about it for a day. So we'll all we'll all be following your Instagram and your TikToks very intently. We'll give out we'll give out all that information at the end of the show. But we're Perfect. we're we're all going to be following along and seeing how he's doing. So when the puppies come along, you give them all breakfast theme names. So yes. how did that come about? <laughs> and think about this while you're answering. What are each of your favorite puppy names you've given so far? Oh, wow. Okay. So we always name our litters. We, we pick a theme because a lot of the new owners change the names. So if we name them all of our best coffee names and then they change it, I will just lose out on the coffee name because I don't like to repeat names. So we say, what goes good with coffee? Breakfast. That's what, that's what you have. So this time we did the Bully Breakfast Club. My favorite name in the Bully Breakfast Club I really like Jelly Roll, probably because I like the musician as well. And I really like Sunny Side Up out of this litter, yeah. the name-wise. What about you? Um, I like Bacon. Bacon's probably my, my favorite. Your favorite <laughs> puppy or your favorite name? Favorite name. I like Bacon. I don't know. Yeah, I, I think like Bacon it. is all of our favorite from top to bottom for many reasons. <laughs> yeah, so. I mean, I love to eat Bacon. Bacon's amazing, and it's just, it's a great name. It just flows. And it's like, it's one of those things that we, we, we're going to keep, Bacon's going to stay home with us at the Bully Brew House, and we're, we were planning on changing his name to a coffee name later on, but it's like, we can't help but still just call him Bacon. So Macy was like, man, it looks like Bacon's going to stay Bacon. <laughs> I, I, I don't think our audience on the podcast is going to stand for you guys changing it. So. <laughs> I don't think so either. <laughs> so... Yeah. We've um we've talked about how you guys are trying to change hearts and minds about the American bully and about bulldog breeds in general. Uh, and I know how important because I read your website and if you haven't checked out their website audience, please go check it out. There's a lot of great inf information there, but I know how important research, education and reputation are to both of you and to achieving your mission of changing hearts and minds. So tell us about the research you've done. Tell us about the research you keep doing on the breed to, and tell us how you use that kind of research to educate the public. I mean, that's the, uh, guys, I can say this, this is her department. Macy is a knowledge to, she craves it. I mean, if anything pops up as far as like with the DNA, as far as the colors, as far as any illness that might be hereditary, Macy's on that computer and just brrr, typing away. She'll just, she's a knowledge fiend. And I love that about her because she'll tell me, like, she's like, look, I did research. And she started sending me these clips and like all these articles. And I mean, it really breaks down what's going on. And then she uses that knowledge into our day-to-day -day life. I mean, it's amazing what she does with that. Because some people aren't so knowledge-based. They're just, they're, okay, I'm going to figure it out, trial and error. Let me try this. It doesn't work. And I mean, it's kind of rough to do that with, when you're dealing with something that's a living being and you're responsible for. So Macy really does a great job of preparing herself, being knowledgeable and knowing what she's doing and then also never making the same mistake twice. She, she prides herself on that. Yeah, absolutely. A lot of research, anytime something comes up and then what I most of the time do, we have a link on our website. It says breeder help. Because I know as a new breeder, you feel lost in the sauce and you learn something new every single day. And I have linked helpful articles that I have used at some point in my life. Even if I didn't use it, I looked it up and I thought it was a great article and I put it on different tabs. So, so you have raising and whelping puppies. Then you have dealing with different illnesses or how to manage symptoms of something or if there's a preventative surgery how to read DNA and coding. So a lot of it is for the breeders, but then there's also training tips for the owners. Right. So we link it all to our website as a kind of like a library, like a breeder library. And I tell our guests on TikTok, because we also have a playlist on there that says breeder life and whelping. And it's all educational videos of us sharing our experience and our journey 
so they know by day 58 you should be going in to get an x-ray for a puppy count and we do it in a format where we just tell our story but someone else can reference it to right. say oh what do I need to do at this point in my dog's pregnancy or what do I need to know when I'm taking my dog home how to introduce it to my other dogs what will my dog need what are some of the things that come with my dog you know preventing a dog from getting overheated right. bullies are just like bulldogs and frenchies at times they can easily get overheated and a lot of people have lost their dogs especially in Las Vegas where it gets ridiculously hot because they didn't recognize the signs of their dog getting overheated or, or overexerted. Yeah, or not knowing your dog's capabilities. Hey, let's go. It's 95 degrees outside, 98 degrees outside. Let's go on a six-mile hike, and I'm going to take my bully with me. You can't do that. I mean, it's just you can't. So people just we, – we try and help everyone and know and put out knowledge out there that's a quick reference for them, and it makes it fun as well. It's just not something that's just – boring and watching they get to see our life and learn while we're learning as well yeah i have an i have a checklist that i use every time we have a litter it's well i didn't use it the last couple of times because at this point it's kind of embedded in my right. head but i used it a lot of times and i send it to my mom when she's gonna have a litter and it lists everything that we need and how to use it. Right. The first time we had a litter of pockets, which we were supposed to go in for a C-section, but Mama Gigi just wanted to have them at home, so the timing didn't line up. I couldn't bring her in to the emergency clinic because it wasn't an emergency, and they'll tell you that. She needs to be pushing for four hours without producing a pup to come to the clinic for a C-section, and our clinic was closed at 2 a.m. So she started having her puppies and I got right into the zone. I knew what to do. It's just since I raised and bred pigs my whole life, dogs are very easy. And Miles is in a little bit of a tizzy or a panic. Guys, I was in a panic. I mean, it's two o'clock in the morning. I realized that she's supposed to be going to the vet. She starts having her puppies here. We wake up and it's just Macy slaps on the gloves and goes straight to business. And I'm like, What's going on? And she literally looked at me. She said, grab the binder, open the binder, and follow the checklist. And I opened the binder, and I, I became an apprentice after that, guys. I was just her second. I was her, I was her third hand. And I just started going through and making the list, doing what I could do, and just assisting her. But she snapped right into it. So the list is amazing. It's a great tool. And we've shared it out to a lot of people. It literally tells you what to do and how to do things. Yeah. I was like, make formula. How do I make formula? Open up to page six. Okay, boom. Never spoke again. I was focused yeah. and he was making the formula. So I think preparing like that, just like you're going to prepare for, if you're in college, a midterm or a final, prepare, take notes, have everything you need. You can never be too prepared. Right. Of course, things will come up. And if things come up that you don't know how to deal with, have a mentor or someone that you can call. Well, that's why we have uh, checklists in the aircraft in the Air Force. So I'm glad you guys have been able to find a, a similar way to do something like that. Um, tell me about mentoring. Tell me about who your mentors are. And tell me about who you're mentoring. Because I think it's really important that in addition to looking for mentors, we look to mentor other people. Yeah, absolutely. So I have a mixture of different mentors. I don't have a mentor in particular. My mom is my go-to person because I get a lot of the research desire, yeah. my desire to research stuff from her. She's the exact same way. And she has even more experience with livestock and dogs and breeding. So we talk, everyone that I mentor or that mentors me is most of our friends in our circle that we talk and just share experiences and knowledge with. Now I do have some Okalani kennels. She is amazing. She's based out of Hawaii. The mom to our litter we actually had imported from Hawaii and she's been breeding for a very, very long time. And there are times that I have reached out to her and she answered me right away. She genuinely loves oh, mentoring. Jesus. Nicole with Oasis French Bulldog. She's out here. She's a whiz. Amazing. We've gotten a lot. So those are my, I know if I need something, I can ask them and they will give me an answer because they've experienced it before. So definitely everyone else, it's just conversation. Yeah. And I think with this business, it's, it's everybody has like, you have a generic form of how to do things, but everybody kind of twists it and does it their own little way. 
So every time you're speaking to a fellow breeder or another breeder, I feel like I learned something in a general conversation, whether that person has had one litter to 15 litters. It doesn't matter because they may do a little something different than I do that works better. So I feel like I'm always learning, always picking people's brains. And that's why the conversation comes organically. We just talk it and you end up picking up something. And I feel like when you talk to someone about that or have a in-depth conversation, both of you guys walk away learning something new. Our vets, yeah. our vets. We had a reproduction specialist. He passed away. It's been just a year from a tragic accident, but he was our go-to guy, a friend, a genius, a humanitarian, yeah. Dr. Vivens. Dr. Vivens. He was just absolutely incredible. So that was definitely a hard loss yeah. for our community because a lot of people looked up to him the same way that we do. But just making relationships with people in the industry. Alex, yeah. Alex is our mentor Five as far as dog training. dog training. So I think it depends on the topic. And we have experts in each field that we have built really great relationships with and it all ends up coming together. Yeah. Yeah, that's astounding. I think we overthink mentoring a little bit and we try to make it a little more, we, we unintentionally make it a little more formal than it needs to be. I love what you said about, it's just about conversations, about learning from, from, from each other. And I think that's what a good mentor-protege relationship is. And sometimes we're the mentor and sometimes we're the protege, right? Right. So, and speaking of relationships, you have built an incredible network of strategic partners to go along with the work you're doing. So, how do you choose who to partner with? And what have you learned from bringing these strategic partners on with your with the Bully Brew House? That's a great question. That's a great question. Go ahead. You can answer? Go ahead. So how do we choose? The first thing we, we start we start with a relationship talking and we want to know what is your goal. We want to make sure that we are in alignment and the vision and the goal is the same. What we have learned is to take things slow, slow down, take your time. And as long as visions and goals will change, especially doing what we're doing, you're creating something, it doesn't turn out how you think. So you have to readjust. You're constantly readjusting. We understand that we're open to that. We're accepting of that. As long as you can have a partner that you can communicate with, communication is key. Right. Knowing that you're not always going to see eye to eye but knowing that you're both open to making adjustments to achieve the same goal, I think that was our biggest lesson. Slow down, communicate effectively, and be open to change. Yeah, yeah. just be able to communicate and work together. And like, I mean, it, it's a give and take relationship when you have partners in this kind of business. Um, it doesn't work when you both dig your heels in the ground and stand your ground. You both gotta give a little, be able to work with each other. And then as far as other partners, like Macy had mentioned earlier with Alex, I mean, Alex, in my opinion, is one of the best dog trainers in Vegas, in the country. And we teamed up with him by just organically meeting him, being referred to a, from a friend to him and brought him here. And the relationship just skyrocketed because he actually taught us a lot about what it's like being a dog owner not necessarily came here and just trained a dog. He was like, I'm going to train you guys as well. And that is something that we've used every day now for every new puppy. We, we offer that knowledge onto the new puppy owners. It just keeps on going. So it's something that we're going to carry on for life. And that's the kind of partnerships I love. We're still friends to this day. We're actually in business together. And the friendship keeps going. We're constantly just using the knowledge that he gave us every day and will continue to. So those kind of partnerships is what we really hope for and strive to make with each other. And I would like to add to, because we're dealing with something that is so, we're so passionate about, we love it. It's, we have to be very careful yeah. and both parties have to bring something to the table. It is not like we're partnering in a stock investment where we both just need to bring money to the table. If that's all that there is, that is not going to work because no. we care entirely too much. And usually the other party cares a lot too, you know, or they care just as much. Our thing is to find people that care equally and have a passion for it. And definitely just, you know, the, if it's education that they bring to the table, that's enough. You know, it's some way that we can be better and it's something that we can use every single day to, to get the mission accomplished. Right. Outstanding. 
Now, one of the ways you're helping with your objectives of changing hearts and minds of the communities is you are very selective about who you let adopt your puppies. So what, what kinds of qualities, what are you looking for in the people you allow to adopt your puppies? And how did you come up with that criteria? How did, how did you figure that out? I mean, it's, it's, we have a contract that we, that we, application, shall I say, that's a few pages long. And some of the questions on the the application is what size home do you live in? Do you live in a house or do you live in an apartment? Do you live in a rent house or do you own your house? Do you have land? What kind of lifestyle do you live? Are you gone for 12 hours out the day and then come home and sleep for eight hours? I mean, um, what else are some of the questions? Do you have another dog at home? Um, small children, small children, because we kind of, we, we want to know those things because we're not trying to set the owners up or the dogs to fail. We do not want to put a dog in a house. That's a rent house because you know what? Puppies are puppies, guys. They're going to chew something. They're going to chew things. They're going to, they're teething. And I don't want this, this new puppy to go into your rent house and chew up the moldings. And then now your landlord's mad and you want to get rid of the dog. I don't want to do that. So we kind of set up. I always say, Macy, I always say this. One of my favorite things to say, it's easier to prevent a problem than to fix a problem. So we always strive by that. I'm a, we want to know how many dogs you have. That way we can work on you introducing a new dog to your family. Or if, the, if you have a small child, we can start training the dog now not to jump on anyone so it doesn't knock down your child. Um, if you live a very active life and you run up, you go run five miles a day. We need to prepare you and let you know that this ain't the type of dog that could go run five miles a day. So we just prepare the owners and prepare the dogs for the right situations. Yeah. And there's a couple of things. So the first thing about the application, which we've kind of scaled back this time and we jumped straight into video chat interviews. Right. If you're super serious, then let's schedule a video chat and let's start getting to know each other. But initially, I was having to knock off so many that didn't complete the contact information. If you didn't put your full name, number, and email, you're not going to have time for your dog. Or you, didn't, you answered the questions very shortly. If you don't take the time to fill out this long application, which I know is long, but you go and sit and fill it out for an apartment if you want to live there, then you're not going to have time for the dog. So there's little things like that that we tell us a lot without you right. actually putting it on paper because anyone can tell you anything. And there has been situations too where not every single time, no matter how hard we try, are we going to make the best match decision? We try, but things come up and it's it doesn't, we've had a, maybe one, really just one. Yeah. We've had one scenario where it didn't work out for the long run for the family and the dog and it was a tragic incident. So it's just... We can do our best to prepare. Not everything's going to be perfect, but we learn from every single situation and how could we have done this better. We are really big on these, an open door policy. Anytime it's not working out, call us. We will take the dog back. Or we at least want the chance to put the dog in the right place before you do anything. You know, so that just protects our dogs. It's very hard. These dogs get very attached to their people. It does not matter if you spend an hour a day or 12 hours a day with them, if they follow you everywhere, they are so clingy and attached. I basically tell everyone, do you treat your, your current pets or your dogs like their children? Cause I do. And they act like that. And they act like that automatically. I could grab one of the puppies right now and they lay on their backs waiting for kisses. Like they're just super spoiled and <laughs> They're super spoiled, they're super loved, and we want the same thing wherever they go. Because right. we have no problem keeping them. That's right. <laughs> well, I love how you are taking this from the approach of setting everyone up for success, setting the puppy up for success, setting the family up for success, setting the community up for success. I think that's, that's really admirable how you're thinking about everybody involved when you're making these decisions. Thank you. Now, you guys are in a relationship together. You're running a company together. What are one or two of the challenges you've come across being in a relationship and running a business together? And how did you overcome them? Well, one of the challenges is, is being able to have that separation. Okay. It's, it's, and now it's coworker. Now it's business partners. Now 
Because, I mean, literally, we spent all of our time together. We live together, we work together, we sleep together, we do everything together. So it's having that separation because you can't take an emo- your, your emotions from your relationship into the business. So you got to be able to learn how to disassociate yourself with that and be like, okay, well, today for this two hours, we're business partners and let's talk like business partners. And I mean, not have to like screaming at each other or want to beat each other up or not, but it's like being able to have an adult conversation and not have so much emotional attached to it to where it's just business and then being able to go back to being in the relationship. I think that was the hardest challenges we had to face. And we're still learning every day. I mean, we're not perfect at it. God forbid we're not. I'm not perfect. But every day we learn a little bit and we get a little bit better at it. Yeah, and we go to therapy and we do things where we set time apart and we intentionally set it for our relationship and for each other. Yeah, because we workaholics. Yeah, because if not, we're just working nonstop. And I'll tell you what, our therapist said it best. She said that it sounds like we operate at such a high level of stress and intensity that anything can can put a riff in your schedule or like ruffle it so you're kind of when you're anyone knows when you're operating at such a high level and you're staying up all the time you're tired you're stressed whatever you can be on edge so the main thing is to effectively communicate with your partner because it's not like you can call them and hang up they're with you all the time effectively communicate say what you need and get through it in that way because it is, it's very hard to just turn it on and yeah. off. And we do, every we work all the time. Yeah. Absolutely. So I think that's the hardest thing is everything's together. There's no clocking in and out. And we have to manage ourselves. That's right. I think that's great advice for anybody who's in business or working with other people, whether you're running a small business like yours, some kind of startup, working in corporate, really great professional and personal relationship lessons and how to how to blend the two so we don't have to feel like we keep those things so separate in a work environment All right you guys have i did i did a little of my research the last couple of days you guys have a really impressive digital presence you have some really really highly viewed tiktok videos so what are some of the tech tools that you guys use to get your message out about american bullies this is her. This is her section, guys. She is the response. She's the one responsible why the Bully Brew House social media is the way it is. I'm, I'm the guy behind the camera, and she just tells me how to film it. So I'm gonna go ahead and let Macy take this over because this is her forte. Some of the tech tools I have a an app that I edit my videos on so that I can repurpose the same video, especially for the voiceovers because I have to be in the mood to do that. If I am not in the mood to do a voiceover and tell a story, it's not gonna get done. I'll procrastinate, I'll put it off. So if I can make one version of it and put it on all platforms, that is a lifesaver, it saves time and it makes it easier. And then I would say just practice, 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 trial and error. If something works for you, Try to redo it. Try to recopy it exactly. If it didn't work as good, figure out what did, what was different about it. And just start studying. What works for me is not going to work for you. I always say that. What works for you is not going to work for me. So start studying and figuring out what works for you. And just try to put little edits and twists on it every single time you, you create it. Outstanding. Uh, good advice even for me as I try to grow my digital presence as well. So thank you for sharing that with us. Absolutely. We're, we're almost halfway through the year, which is hard to believe. So what is it you guys want to accomplish in 2024? What are you focused on to get there? How are you going to need to grow your team to do this? Tell me what's coming up in 2024 for the Bully Brew House. Oh, I mean, uh, we're, we're working vigorously right now to get some distributors in Canada that'll be distributing our coffee in Canada. So that'll be huge. Um, that's really a big thing that we're focusing on right now. Yeah, our first international yeah. distribution of our coffee. And then I would say with our partner, All That in a Latte, I wanted to mention this earlier because they are our coffee partners. Amazing. And originally when we were seeking out coffee shops and other coffee partners, we were going to 
make it pretty broad. But with working with them, it was such a click. It works so naturally. And they care about their coffee business as much as we care about the Bully Brew House. I mean, she pays attention to every single detail and presents our coffee in such a high value way. We decided that we want to be more exclusive and only work with people that are like her. So she set the tone, her and her husband, Corey, Jackie and Corey, they set the tone for who we want to work with. So at this point, we're striving to achieve goals with them. Right. We just did the Napa event, the culinary kickoff. Yeah. And then... Shop Talk at uh, Mandalay. Yeah, which was a big convention. And then we have... I know you're not going to post this right away, so I'll tell you because by the time it comes, it's happening this week and we'll already have been done with it. But we just booked the Power of Love event that honors Blake Shelton. So we're going to be there. We have an espresso martini venture that we put together that came through with the collaboration. It's ultimately her setup. She's using our coffee and we just each have a skill to yeah, showcase. Pretty much Jackie sets up her coffee, her bar, and she brings her espresso machines and she uses our beans and she makes amazing coffee. She's kind of whipped up some Little recipes that, I mean, some amazing white chocolate, all kinds of crazy, amazing coffees. And then I'm right next to her shaking up some espresso martinis. So it, it really works hand in hand. I can't thank those guys enough. And I can't talk more about how amazing our partnership has been. So I want to I want to excel more with them and get more things going with them. Because, I mean, it's just, it's working amazing. Yeah. So launching our brand internationally and... Bumping up the bar with what we already have existing. Yeah. That's outstanding. Well, I'll see if I can get this piece of the show cut out and clipped so we can get that out before your event. And I would love it if you guys would get some video of Miles shaking up those those uh, martinis so we can put that in his B-roll and people can be watching Miles doing that as I'm saying this right now when they watch the episode in Perfect. about a week. Absolutely. Yes. I, I yeah, have we have some, yeah, we have a bunch of footage from the culinary kickoff. That was an amazing event and we have some footage, so we can send you that for sure. All right. Yeah, I can't wait. I can't wait to see it. What was one of the best mistakes you've ever made, and what did you learn from it? Wow, that's a great question. Best mistakes. Buying Midas. <laughs> <laughs> but it was Oh, wait. No, it wasn't a mistake. Yeah. But... Tell them. Okay, so um, Macy actually, I, I like, a, uh, again, we talked about, I come from a long time of breeding pit bulls. Um, and I got out of the business. Me and Macy got together. Being a dog person, we've always loved dogs. Always talked about the bullies. Well, we go home one night. Quick story. We go home one night, and we're sitting in the living room, and we're just watching TV. Well, it comes about 11, 12 o'clock, and I'm like, hey, I'm going to bed. She's like, no, you got to stay up with me. And I'm like, for what? She's like, because I just want to hang out. And I'm like, dude, I'm tired. I got to. I want to go to bed. So she's like, no, you got to stay up with me. So we stay up. I say it's about 1.45, 2 in the morning. She's like, oh, I got to go. I got to go in the room. We lived in, by this time, guys, we lived in a one-bedroom apartment. Small. So she, I mean, it's, it's 700 square feet. You know what I mean? So she goes in the, in the room and I'm like, man, what's taking her so long? So I open the door. I know Macy. I look underneath the bed. I thought she was going to pop out and scare me because she has a tendency of doing this a lot. Just like a pop out and scare me at random times. So I'm looking underneath the bed. I'm looking in the closet. I'm looking all over. And then I, our apartment had a back door from the, from the master bedroom to outside. She walks in from outside and I'm like, what were you doing out there? She's like, oh, we checked the mail. And I'm like, at two in the morning, right? What are you, something's going on. She's like, hey, there's a knock at the door. And I'm like, what do you mean there's a knock, boop, 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 then there's a knock at the door. She's like, go answer it. So I'm like, okay, feeling real fishy, like something shady's really going on. I don't know what's going on. Like, so I open the door and there's this guy holding a puppy. And Macy had surprised me with our first bully who is an American bully, He's but he's a standard class, and his name is Midas. And Midas is the guy that kind of started off the whole bully brew house kind of situation. So I wouldn't say a mistake because 
as far as a mistake, he's not a breeding dog. He's more of a pet. But the best thing was was getting him because it, it skyrocketed or of what we are now. Yeah, looking back now as breeders, we have very limited space. We would yeah. like to keep more than we can. So we're, we're limited. <laughs> so we have several pets that they're not breeding dogs. We've never bred them. We spayed them or neutered them because we just love them. But if we knew we were going to be breeders, maybe we would have put our money into, you know, buying a breeding dog. Right. But at the same time, we would never change that because Midas is, like Miles said, the reason why we fell in love with the breed. He's the reason why my mom fell in love with That's the right. breed. He changed her perspective on the dog. She thought they were terrible. Then she met Midas and she did a lot of Your research. Grandfather. My grandfather, they were all very scared of pit bulls and they didn't understand the American bully. So he... He alone has changed so many perspectives and has made so many people fall in love with the breed, including us. We would never change that. That's a that's an amazing story. That's that's a lot of fun, and I'm I'm gonna be watching out for Macy next time I'm out somewhere with you guys, you have to, making, Jason, making sorry, sure she's not popping out of closets or out from under tables or something like that. Yeah, so. I mean, it's literally we go to bed and I start turning off all the lights, and then I'm like. Where she's at, because she'll just scurry off and disappear. And I know the minute I'm walking into the room, like I'm prepared. And then what'll happen is she's not doing it. She's like, what are you doing? Like, because I'm so on the edge. <laughs> so who is someone you admire as a leader or in business? Someone I admire? In, the, in my business or just overall? Overall. I have a couple of Go ahead. people. Someone not related to me, not biased, is Gary V. I love Gary Vayner's story. I love, I watch his videos a lot for marketing and education. I wish we had hired him for our marketing team at some point. We didn't. We decided to go the hard route and start doing it ourselves, which is working. So we, we, we're not going to change something that's not broken. Later, we would definitely like to invest in what he has going on. I think he's an expert and he. He grew his wine business for his dad, similarly to our story of how we're just growing our business for generational wealth later on, but for our family with my mom and all of that. So he's someone I really look up to. I watch all of his stuff for tips. And then I think personally, I look up to my mom, just seeing her very persistent, never giving up through all of her business ventures since I was a little kid. I watched her go through working a nine to five to wanting to be a business owner and that not working out so many times, but her never giving up and her always finding a way. She always finds a way and it always works out for her. And that is very motivating for me. That is encouraging. And that really instills, I can do this. I can do this. And it helps us, or for me specifically, and Miles says the same yeah. thing. It helps us not quit, not give up whenever it gets going and whenever it's challenging. And then you all also usually say, if this was so easy, everyone would do it. That's right. So. Yeah, I mean, I have to say one of my idols and a person I look up to is David Goggins. I mean, the dude is an extraordinary human being. The things he has accomplished in his life is just amazing. And it just goes to show you that mind over matter is a thing. You know what I mean? Your mind is the most powerful thing in the world. And if you just don't quit, don't quit. And what he says is most people quit when they have 40% left. You know what I mean? So it's just, he really, he's, he's a hero in my eyes and the things that he has done. And he's just, I've listened to his book four or five times, like just over and over. And I watch his, his rallies and his speeches because he's just amazing. And I would have to say, um, my father was a hero of mine. Um, just showing what you can give up and what you can sacrifice and how just being a good father is, is very, very important. Like my dad was a truck driver and was gone for a lot of my life, but he did that because of he wanted his family to have everything. And that's being a dad is what that's about, is giving it to your family. And since my dad has passed, I'd have to say her mom. Her mom is a person I look up to because exactly like she said, her mom finds if there's a will, there's a way. This woman is one of the strongest women I have ever known and the strongest person I have ever met in my entire life. The type, the type of obstacles that she has to go through or has had gone through and wakes up every morning with a 
not always a smile on her face, but will be happy to be alive and be happy to be in her in her skin and be who she is. It's it's true. It's it's it, it blows my mind. That's all I can say. I mean, she's truly an inspiration. Awesome. So besides Macy popping out from under beds, what what keeps you up at night? What are the what are the challenges that are really on your mind running the company and trying to change hearts and minds about American bullies? And, and how are you dealing with them? Bookkeeping, that keeps me up. Yeah. Being more organized, that's something he's taking over because he's better in that department. I have so many things on my, my mind, the way my brain works, that I will naturally stay up or I can't even fall asleep or I'll be thinking about it first thing in the morning. And I think organization, having better organization would keep me up less. So I think bookkeeping and paperwork and just something so simple that needs to be done in every single business. And if you're not good at it, just accept it, admit it. You can't do everything and have someone else do it because it is so, so, so important. And then besides our dogs, that's it. Yeah. I mean, to be honest with you, Jason, I'm really, I'm happy with where, I mean, we, I, I always want to grow and always want to be better and always want to do other things. But as far as where we are in life right now with business and me and Macy's relationship and how I am, I see good at night. I mean, I think my life is really, really good. I get to wake up every day, play with puppies, film dogs, spend that time with the person I love the most. And that's, I mean, you can't ask for more than that. I'm not the richest person in the world, but I'm okay. And my life is great. My life is great. There are some things I can't alter. And there's some things that I want to do in the future to make my life better. But as far as now, I sleep amazing. I think appreciating where, where we are. We've had to come a long yeah. way because we spent sleepless nights. We, we didn't achieve this goal. We want to achieve this. We want to move into a new house. We need yeah. more land always worried about what you need and what you want and what's next that will stress you out and keep you up instead of just appreciating where you are what you have working with that and going with it a lot a lot more things will open up once you just stop trying to force things you know it is it will be what it will be I love that. And it fits right into my next question was going to be someone or something you're grateful for. Do you guys have anything to add in that vein? Because it sounds like you're already really appreciative and grateful for what you've got. Yeah, I mean, I'm appreciative of Macy because, I mean, not everybody can I'm, I'm, not everybody can work with me and not everybody has the same goals that I do. And I think finding a person that shares the same passion, same goals and same drive as you do is you've, you've, you've hit the lottery. You know what I mean? It's, it's because she's, she makes me better. She holds me accountable and I make her better and I hold her accountable. And just, there's never any days that's like, she's just laying down and we're both being lazy. Like, no, let's go. We got to do it. You know what I mean? As much as we want to, but we, we help each other. And just to find that person that you work with is, is amazing. And like I said, I feel like I hit the lottery. So, Aww, that's sweet. Yeah. Yeah, we don't always show it, but we definitely feel it. And whenever we get these opportunities, thanks for asking that question because it always makes us feel better. Right. Uh, same thing. I, at the end of the day, Miles and I only have Miles and I. Yeah. We know that. We have we have great support. We have friends. We have great business partners. You know, we have my mom, all of that. But no one is going to care about the Bully Brew House and our life and our livelihood as much as we will about our own. So the fact that we have each other to push each other to keep going. I, I can't think of a better way to put it than that. Is there any other advice you would give to future leaders or entrepreneurs, especially about folks who want to advance a social cause like you are? I mean, just, I would say follow your goal and stick to it. No matter what you come through, no matter what obstacles you face, no matter how hard it may seem, just keep going. That's it. It doesn't matter what it takes. Just go for it. And it's, it's, it's a beautiful thing. And find you a teammate and find you a partner that shares the same values. And that way you could tackle it as a team. But there's nothing in the world stopping you but you. That's it. I mean, that's it. You, you rely on yourself and just you hold yourself accountable and keep going. My advice is it's not for everyone. And you will have to develop tough skin. Absolutely. If you're trying to 
make a change, create awareness for anything, any type of controversial topic where someone might have a different idea, right. get ready. You have to always wear your armor. You have to put a smile on your face. At best, you have to try to be professional. But at the same time, you are fighting for something that you believe in. And people are going to come for you. They're going to come for you in so many... They're going to come for what you built, for what you believe in, for what you feel passionate about. And if you're not... If you can't take that, it's, it's not going to work out. Right. It's not going to work out. And I say that because when I started probably having a viral video... And I can say my first viral video, I received over a million views on my beauty page. And it was with a client that I was working on an anti-aging treatment with her. So one of my hobbies and what I was doing as a career is I'm also a permanent makeup artist and I do other skin treatments that I had a long story short, I had a studio. It became a job. I didn't want to do it. I wanted to focus on the Bully Brew House. At that time when my video took off, great, my beauty business is going. But these people started um, making fun of my client's skin. And I was like, no, 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 no. And saying, oh, your voice sounds like Dora, whatever. I think that's a compliment. So I, uh, great, I got your attention now. It worked. But just reading all of the backlash and I backed off. Did yeah. not want to post on that account anymore. You would think after, you know, something, a milestone in that, you would want to keep going. I backed off. Next video happens on our other page, completely on a different page. And people started criticizing our dog, which yeah. is basically like you're criticizing my child. So I am going to stick to my guns. The difference was I did not want my client, who's a person, to feel bad about herself. So I think that scared me more off of that. But with my dogs, they have no voice. I am their voice. So I wanted to stand up for them. And that's ultimately what really got me attached and what kept me going on the social media side of things was the fact that you're not gonna criticize my dogs. You can, whatever, but I'm not gonna tolerate it and I'm gonna stand up for them. So if not, I went through the same period of feeling like this is overwhelming, this is anxiety. It's basically like internet bullies or internet trolls you're going to deal with. And I've seen people cry. That's why they say don't read the comments. Don't read the comments unless you have a plan on how you're going to deal with it. Yeah. Well, I think standing up for those who don't have a voice is always good advice for anyone in any situation. So thank you so much for, for that. What else should we know about you both and the Bully Brew House, and where can everyone find you? You can find us on all social medias. We are the Bully Brew House. You can also find us online with our website, and then you will see us at local events. We do different pop-up events for animals. We do dog shows. We were even talking about the Reptile Expo because we're looking at partnering with someone that's also into reptiles, and they have a food business. So you'll find us pretty much doing all the things that we love. If you don't find us directly online, eating, socializing, out with our animals. Right. And mostly uh, any local bully shows or any dog shows around the Vegas, California area, we're most likely going to be there unless something else. We have a litter or something like that going on. But as Macy said, the Bully Brew House, Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, on our website, YouTube. Um, YouTube. Yeah. Outstanding. Well, we will see you out and about Las Vegas in the Southwest, and I can't wait to run into you guys again somewhere. Thank you so much for both being here today. Thank you all for tuning in. If you liked Miles and Macy, please reach out to them and thank them for joining us today. Also, check out some of our other videos, and please like, comment, share, and subscribe. We love your support. We love to hear from you, and we love having these conversations and letting you be part of them. So get out there today. Make an impact onward and upward. Thank you so much, Jason. Thank you, Jason.